Hi, everyone, and welcome to our seventh annual symposium on G&E myopathy. Um, like everyone else, uh, this year we've uh, made a pivot in what is to become the, quote, new normal after COVID and um, are basically going to be presenting our symposium uh, in a new way. Uh, virtually and rather than jam all of the presentations together in one day where everyone is gathered together we are going to be able to present them in what we're going to be calling a GNEM symposium speaker series this will allow um, uh, for I think greater reach and more impact and allow each of us to take these complex ideas that our scientists present to us and be able to fathom them, digest them, and ask questions. So moving forward, uh, this is the first of a series, um, and I'm delighted to introduce uh, Monkal Leck, Dr. Monkal Leck, and Dr. Angela Leck from Yale, with whom we've now had a multi-year relationship, and we've been funding their lab, the Leck Lab at Yale, so that they can do specific kinds of uh, studies, which they're going to discuss a little bit today. So without further ado, if we could go to the next slide, um, I want to introduce uh, this topic uh, that we'll be discussing today, uh, Rachel, which is Dr. Leck, uh, both of them, will be making an, uh, a presentation and the overview of this talk, for those of you who kind of want to get an, a feel for what we're going to be talking about, is using gene editing like a CRISPR-Cas9 as a potential therapy for GNE myopathy. Um, the other type of GNE, the other kind of gene therapy for GNE myopathy is not so much gene editing, but it's gene replacement therapy, so or gene modification. So uh, Monkel and Angela will help explain that further for you. Um, but it's a type of gene therapy, and it's a very interesting discussion. So again, I'm not going to delay this any further. If you go to the next slide, I would like you to welcome Monkel and Angela to their presentation. Take it away, guys. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak to you here today. You can still hear me, right? <laughs> um, yes, we can. Thank you. OK. And today we will be talking about exploring the potential of gene editing as a therapeutic in gene myopathy. So, um, all right, so, okay, we'll begin by going over some of the basic concepts in human genetics, so how and why we get genetic diseases. Then I'll talk about um, current technologies that scientists are using to try to fix genetic diseases. And then Monko will jump in and discuss some of the work that the lab is doing to explore gene editing technology for gene myopathy. And finally, I'll um, summarize and end on the future directions of the work. So just a quick refresher. Um, in the center of each one of our cells is a collection of um, chromosomes that we inherit from our parents. And packed tightly within each one of these chromosomes are our DNA. What DNA really is, is a string of four um, nucleic acid bases that can be represented as A's, T's, G's, and C's. And together they encode our genetic instructions. So our genes can encode a, a message and this message can then be translated by the cells to make um, a functional protein. Um, what proteins are, um, are essentially little molecular machines with very specific and specialized jobs inside the cell. One example that you're all very familiar with is the Gini protein. Um, it's an enzyme that scientists have discovered has two separate functional domains that it can use to catalyze two different steps um, of the sialic acid biosynthesis pathway um, that is used uh, to make changes to other proteins on the cell surface. And faulty Gini gene means that sialic acid levels um, and the changes that they make on the surface of muscle proteins are reduced, as you can see here in Gini myopathy muscle fibers compared to control. So Gini myopathy is a genetic disease that is autosomally recessive. Um, inherited, meaning that you need two bad copies um, of the gene in order to manifest symptoms. 
And this happens 25% of the time when um, uh, uh, two carrier individuals um, with harboring no symptoms, so because they have one good copy and one bad copy of the gene when they come together um, and have a child. Um, this table here lists some of the common mutations observed in the GNE gene. Um, this column denotes the changes on the DNA level, and this uh, column here shows the corresponding change on a protein level. Um, and these are um, some of the uh, ethnic populations that these mutations are associated with. So how do we go about fixing a genetic disease? Well, the short answer is it's really difficult. So imagine trying to change the color of your hair permanently, something that is hard coded in your DNA. We are really the first generation poised to attempt something like this. And it's been made possible because of the collective knowledge over many decades um, that scientists have acquired on how the body works on a molecular level. So in order to overcome defective or missing genes in patients, scientists have devised what are known as genetic therapies. And today I'll talk to you about the two main forms of genetic therapies. Um, the first is gene replacement, which introduces a new copy, a working copy of the gene. And the, the second is gene editing, which introduces components to repair the defective gene. Both strategies can theoretically work to correct GNE myopathy. So this schematic here convey, uh, conveys in a nutshell the difference between how the two technologies work. So in gene replacement therapy, the strategy is to introduce a new working gene to work alongside the faulty genes. Whereas in gene editing, we're not really introducing a gene but really the components to repair the faulty gene that exists um, in patient cells. In this case, um, the components to, uh, to do CRISPR gene editing, as well as the genomic address, um, which we want to target the CRISPR editing components to. I've also drawn up a simple table of comparison here to highlight some of the main um, differences between the two technologies. So does it place a new copy, uh, a working copy of the gene? Is it mutation dependent? Does it use viral vectors? Um, does it make changes to your DNA? So gene replacement therapy, I wanted to note, is um, uh, has been around for longer than gene editing. So it has examples of both um, being used in clinical trials as well as FDA approved um, examples, whereas gene editing is relatively new um, within maybe the last five years. So it only has examples of its use in clinical trials and um, none of it has um, yet received the FDA um, status of approval. So with gene replacement therapy, it's been typically applied um, in cases such as uh, uh, spinal muscular atrophy or DMD, where patients are essentially missing um, a healthy copy of the gene. So in, with gene replacement therapy, what's happening is that you're introducing a healthy copy of the gene um, to then restore cell function. Uh, whereas in gene myopathy, it's a little bit different um, because patients aren't exactly missing the gene protein. Instead, um, what they make is a faulty version of the protein. So with gene replacement therapy, what we're looking at would be to introduce a new um, working copy of the gene to work alongside um, the, the existing faulty copies of the gene. So some successful stories of gene replacement being used to correct genetic diseases are in spinal muscular atrophy and Duchenne muscular dystrophy, two diseases that affect young children. And I encourage you to watch some of the amazing videos of before and after treatment in these children because it's the effects on these kids have really been very noticeable. Um, but uh, that's not to say it is a cure per se, but the differences is very drastic. And we have to be careful to manage ex expectations that we may not see such a drastic effect in late onset genetic diseases that affect adults, such as in gene myopathy. Given that GE uh, myopathy is a slow and progressing disease compared to SMA and, and DMD, scientists are wondering how will we know if the therapy has worked? 
um, because it's not expected that patients are going to get up and start running. So a lot of work has gone in, into trying to establish outcome measures that can be used in clinical trials to, tell, to test if this gene replacement therapy has worked. So gene editing, as I said, is a newer form of gene therapy. And, it, and the most common form is using a technology known as CRISPR-Cas9, which is a really powerful tool that lets you directly modify your DNA. So what exactly is CRISPR and how does it work? Well, scientists first discovered CRISPR components when they were studying the immune defense system of bacteria. Um, so what happens, what scientists see is that when bacteria is infected uh, with a virus, um, what they can do is, is store um, segments of, of, of the uh, viral genome into their genome in, in known as the CRISPR region. Um, so it, it, what they're essentially doing is collecting snapshots of the viral genome, which they can then pass on to a protein known as Cas9 that can act as molecular scissors to then say, if we ever see this gene again entering our cell, we can then cut it up and um, destroy it. So that's essentially the basics of how CRISPR works. Scientists can then take advantage of this property to cut DNA at very um, precise changes in the genome to make changes of their own. And the basic components of CRISPR technology to achieve this includes the Cas9 protein itself, which can be used as a homing device and it has cutting properties um, to, uh, to insert or correct mutations. And also it functions alongside what's known as guide RNA, which is, provides a genomic address and targets the Cas9 protein to a specific region in the genome. So CRISPR gene editing has been tried in dog models of Duchenne muscular dystrophy and has shown great success, where it can restore um, a, a protein that's missing in Duchenne muscular dystrophy known as dystrophin um, that, uh, uh, that, that you can find uh, along the, um, the membranes of muscle fibers. As you can see in the DMD uh, dogs, they're missing this protein and um, Dosing with the CRISPR uh, gene editing technology at a low dose restores some of this dystrophin protein, but when you go into higher doses, you can see um, high levels of dystrophin are restored in pretty much every muscle. So this really is the first evidence that this technology can be applied to systemically treat um, muscle wasting diseases. In humans, CRISPRs have been used to edit sickle cell disease, where you can see that after gene editing, the proportion of cells that have sickle uh, crescent-shaped cells, which is denoted by the red arrows here, are reduced. The gene editing process, however, um, in this case, is done outside um, of the human body. So, um, and is then put back into the body. And this is not feasible for a mature skeletal muscle that is not a localized organ, but it's sort of everywhere in the body. So the first in-body human CRISPR trial, which is what we envision would work for muscle wasting diseases, was attempted in the eye to treat a genetic form of blindness. This technology, um, although very new, has gained a lot of traction and it's rapidly being trialed uh, for many other genetic diseases. So with that, I'm going to pass on to Monko to start on his section. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very, uh, thank you, Angela, for a wonderful introduction, and thank you for everyone for um, for giving up your afternoon or midday or wherever it is in your own time zone. So uh, I'm happy to be here and happy for NDF for giving me the invite to share some of the um, our knowledge on CRISPR editing and some of the things that we we're trying here um, at Yale and also. You know, I'd love to be here in person, to present in person. I think we were scheduled to have the symposium, the patient symposium in Boston. I was really looking forward to it, but everyone knows what happened instead. So, so I'm going to touch upon uh, first of all uh, my own story in terms of CRISPR editing, and 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 so to give it a context. So, 
So I got a gen genetic diagnosis in 2011. In 2016, um, collaborators actually took a skin biopsy. So many thanks to a lot of the uh, patients in the audience that um, have give, given skin biopsies uh, for um, some of the stu research studies that we're doing. And hopefully you can see by the end of this presentation, some of the important, uh, important studies that we can do given the skin biopsy and creating fibroblasts from that skin biopsy. So in terms of the CRISPR editing, what they did with my cells after they, uh, they had taken out of with um, that, my mutation is actually an eight base pair duplication and serendipity would have it that the Cas9 cuts right in the middle of the mutation. And then that allows for one copy of the mutation to collapse in upon itself. So we have one perfect copy. So these are my cells and them correcting it. So the correction they achieved was 80%. So if you don't un didn't get all of that, it wasn't to give you, um, it wasn't for you to understand all of it. It was just to give you a feel for, you know, some of that potential and it actually happening in my life myself. So I'm very excited to actually work with this technology and seeing what its potential is for gene e myopathy and for patients like yourself in the audience. So some of the stuff I'll be touching upon is repeating upon what Angela said, but repetition is good, especially when you're being introduced with a very new complicated topic. So in terms of gene myopathy genetics, gene myopathy, as far as we know, all cases are recessive cases. So that means that each one of your parents, if you're an affected patient in the audience, has one defective copy of the gene. So there's a one in 25, uh, one in four chance or 25% chance that you'll have an affected copy just by probability alone. And, uh, and a 25% chance of not having two normal copies and a 50% chance of being a carrier. So it's a recessive disorder where the parents are carriers and they're unaffected. So just having one good copy and one bad copy is not enough to cause disease. And that to cause disease, you have to have two copies that are defective. But here's the thing, if we know that parents of patients are unaffected, if you only correct one copy, that should be sufficient to actually escape from disease. And it's a very important concept to keep in mind for gene editing, not gene replacement, but for gene editing. So how do you make it actually feasible? So in gene myopathy, there, there's one good thing that actually makes it sort of like amenable to CRISPR editing. And the fact that, and this is not uh, this is not the case for all neuromuscular diseases, but in the case of gene myopathy, there are common mutations. In other words, what geneticists would say, founder mutations. They're called founder mutations is because someone in a particular region of the world would get the mutation and then over time their ancestors would inherit this mutation. And then when two of their ancestors uh, decide to have children, they're both carriers of this mutation, they then have an affected child. So a lot of these founder mutations, as you can see in this table, are restricted to particular regions of the world because of that. Uh, because of you know the inheritance um, through time through your ancestors that actually happened. So most patients, um, a lot of people in this audience I know because we've uh, you know genotyped you um, in either whole genome studies or also genotyping the cells that you donated have at least one of these mutations because they're so common. Some people even have two of these mo mutations, and most of the times it's the same mutation. So in genetic speak, they would be actually homozygous. So, so, uh, so one way you could design a genetic editing strategy is to design some to these common mutations so it will benefit the most amount of, uh, of people in, the, in this strategy. So I'm going to step up on, I'm going to give you a bit of a CRISPR 101, uh, 101 on what we would do in the lab in terms of designing a, a CRISPR editing strategy. The first is we have to actually select which mutation we actually want to correct. And what we did here at Yale is select one of the common mutations again, because we wanted to benefit the most people. And also um, on a second note, we would be most likely to have patient cells to actually test them on because they, they are the common mutations. The next is we have to select appropriate CRISPR technology. So Angela briefly touched upon that. I'll touch upon it again, um, what we're trying to achieve given the mutation that we actually have in gene myopathy. Next, we have to design what we call uh, an address RNA. So, so people with gene myopathy, if they only have one um, type of mutation, have 
as we would say it, one typo in three billion letters that actually cause the disease. And the, the great thing about CRISPR is it can be programmable and go to that, that address, that one typo in the three billion letters. And I think that's the greatest thing about this technology, the ability to actually home in on where that mutation is in, in your genome. The next is to validate the, um, the cells that are easy to deliver the guide. So I'm gonna to touch upon that. Getting therapeutics into cells, even on in the lab on a dish is quite hard. It's not trivial. So I'm gonna to touch upon the three methods we use and why we actually use a different cell line for prototyping. And the last is to validate um, our design, our strategy on patient cells, which we have plenty of thanks to everyone during the patient symposiums um, donating skin biopsies so we actually can produce those cells. First is selecting a common mutation to correct. Like I said, there are common mutations gene and myopathy, typically called in genetics, found in mutations based on having one person who has that mutation and then passes it on to their ancestors. So the reason why we want to do founder mutations other than them being common is that they're very well studied. So we know they cause disease. Not every variant we know may cause disease, but founder mutations, because there's so many people gene with, with that mutation, we know it causes disease. Mouse models, there are plenty of mouse models, especially for um, the, the Middle Eastern founder mutation, and also for the Japanese founder mutation. The next is that there are a lot of patient cells. So we have a lot of patient cells in our lab, which we share with the world that we can actually check for this correction. They have to have this mutation. They, they can't just have gene myopathy. They have to have this mutation for us to target, correct and validate it. So here is the mutation that we first chose. But for those in the audience that don't have this mutation, what I'm presenting to you, the process would be very similar if we were to pick another common mutation or if we were to pick a rare mutation should you have two rare mutations but we want to pick a common founder mutation mainly for those three reasons so i'm going to touch upon again reiterating um, what CRISPR does um, in my own words and its ability to precisely edit the genome so i see CRISPR as a system with two major components or two things so one is the guide rna and i touched upon this the great thing about the guide RNA um, pictured here, the green thing here is that it can be programmed. So by setting a sequence on it, it can tell, it, it can tell the Cas9 protein where to go in the genome. So my analogy is it's like giving someone your address. So you'll have to specify your house number, your street number, the town you live in and your zip code. And then you can actually go to that address because you have all the details. So you can think of that sequence as the address in the genome that you want the Cas9 to go to. So the Cas9 protein itself, as Angela said, the Cas9 was actually a, a protein part of the bacterial defense system. And, and so it still does what, you know, but we're reprogramming it. So the Cas9 will use the guide RNA to actually go to that address it uses it to go to that address and it binds there. And when it binds there, it actually, it actually cuts that DNA. But the great thing what scientists have done is, what if we wanted to go to a particular address in the genome, but we didn't want it to cut the DNA? What if we wanted to do something else? And so what, um, what scientists have done throughout the world, particularly at the Broad Institute, is actually uh, reprogram the Cas9 to not actually cut but just to use its homing capabilities to go to a particular place in the genome. And then you can actually attach other proteins to Cas9 so it actually can do other functions when it gets to that particular place in the genome. So what are the desired properties for correcting the gene uh, per, uh, uh, Middle Eastern mutation? So the methionine 743 threonine change, the amino acid change. And what underlies that change is actually a single base change, a T to C. So think about it, just that one change in 3 billion letters causes gene myopathy, and we actually want to change it back. So, so the properties we need to have in, um, in the, CRISPR, uh, the CRISPR technology that we choose is the ability to target that place in the genome. So not all places can be targeted. I won't go into the technical details, 
but not all places can be targeted by CRISPR. So it needs to be able to target it. The second thing is it needs to be able to precisely change the C back to a T. We don't want to C back to an A. We don't want to C to a G. We want to C back to a T. So this in, in chemistry is called base, uh, it's a base transition. I won't go into the details of that. The next is to edit the change at high efficiency. Just because you can go there, change the C to the T, we still want that to happen more often than not because it's still a probabilistic event like everything in biology. So we want that to happen at high efficiency. And the last thing is to reduce off target. So even though you give it an address, we want to we want to make sure it doesn't go to similar addresses. For example, everyone in this audience has probably had their mail in their neighbor's mailbox. We don't want situations like that or their mail at their same address, same house number, same street number, but in a different town. So we don't want that to happen. Sometimes it does accidentally happen. So we want to pick a design where that is less likely to happen. So we want to pick a very unique place in the genome to actually for that to happen. One thing I want to briefly touch upon when selecting the CRISPR technologies is the, the three different types of CRISPR technologies. And the first type is the oldest and the first discovered type. And this is your classic CRISPR. So this is just taking it from the bacteria and making pretty much no changes. So what it does is its original function. Given an address, it will go to that place in the genome and make a double-stranded break. And what will happen is the DNA repair mechanisms in your cell will quickly try and fix it. And when it quickly tries to fix it, it doesn't do a good job most of the times. So it will be missing a few, ba uh, a few letters or will insert a few letters. So it creates an imprecise change. Sometimes an imprecise change is good enough and it's good enough to achieve what you need to achieve. But in gene myopathy, it won't be good enough to achieve what we want to achieve. What we want to achieve is precise um, editing. So as I said, a C back to the T. So to get that precise editing, we have to, one thing we did try in the lab is CRISPR-based editing. So what that does is it goes to an exact place in the genome and it can change one letter to another letter. So you can see um, this was, um, this began to become available to scientists around two, late 2017. But there were many challenges with using this technology, which we used in the first uh, NDF funded grant. And some of these, don't worry if you don't understand all of this, is for the scientists and the world read in the audience is that one is that the PAM sequence, uh, there wasn't one in close proximity to the, um, to the Middle East mutation. In other words, it was hard to target it to that place in the genome using this technology. Next is it didn't have an optimal editing window. So what would happen is it would change all, all of a particular letter to another letter and it doesn't care which. And so it isn't that precise in the editing window itself. It was only capable of base transition. So in the case of gene myopathy, as I put in the brackets, that isn't a problem, but it will be a problem for other founder mutations in gene myopathy. The next is strand specific. So DNA has two strands and it only can target one strand or another. So the design was kind of really, really restrictive. And the last is bystander bases may be edited. So in that optimal editing window, if it was the editor T, if there was three T's in that optimal editing window, it would edit all of them. And so we'll edit more than we would like, and that's an issue. So one of the things we started trying um, in, um, in Yale is this new technology. And you can see how new this technology is. It came out in 2019. So towards the last quarter of 2019, this technology uh, became available. What this technology is, is um, it's called uh, CRISPR prime editing. So Attached to the Cas9 protein is this other protein. This protein's um, job is if you've provided a template, so a substitute of what you want to put at a particular place in the genome, it will read off the template and insert it into that place. So I'm not going into the, the fine molecular uh, details of that, but that's what it actually does. So, so it has three components in its design. One is the guide RNA and 
hopefully repetition is good. It's the address in the genome you want to go to. In this case, we want to go to um, the gene mutation, the, the Middle Eastern mutation. The next is the primer binding site. I won't go into the details of that. The next is the reverse transcript phase template. So this is what you actually want to substitute. So in that template is the C to T change. So we want it back to a working copy of Genie that we want to put precisely there. And unlike uh, CRISPR-based editing, it has no um, bystander effects. It only corrects just that because we're actually providing a template. What we actually want to, as the, the inventors of this technology would say, find and replace, like what you would do in a Word document. So the next is actually trying it on cells. So getting things into cells is pretty hard. Um, and there are three ways in our lab and a lot of people's labs that they actually try. So the first is lipid-based methods. So it's when you package the DNA in, in these lipid molecules, or you can think of it as if you've seen oil droplets before, it's like putting in an oil droplet and it allows it to cross the cell membrane a lot easier. Other, another way you can get it, uh, the DNA to cross cell membranes is through electroporation. So you, pr pr um, you apply electricity and this makes small holes in the membrane and for that brief moment, DNA can get in. So this is the machine we use. Um, in the lab and someone gave it an affectionate name in the lab, you can see here by its label. The, the last thing is viruses and this is what gene therapy uses to deliver into, in, in, into, um, into muscle cells. And viruses is another way of efficiently getting it into the cells. So what we tend to use in the lab first when we're trialing and developing a technology is using a cell line such as HEC293 because it's a lot easier to get DNA in. So if you're testing your ability to edit a place, you want to work with something, you want to work with something, not only just cells, but everything that's a lot easier. And that way you can iterate faster and prototype faster to see which design is actually the best. So this is an example of actually doing CRISPR prime editing on the HEC293 cells. So in, these are two examples of targeting particular places in the genome. And so, so the place we're actually targeting is in that red box. So for those that haven't seen the chromatogram before, I'll briefly explain what you're looking at here. Each one of these peaks represents um, what nucleotide or base is in that position of the genome. And you can see it's a nice clear signal each time where blue represents a C, a, uh, a is represented by a green peak um, and T and, and G you can see are represented by red and black respectively. And you can see after we perform CRISPR um, editing on the cells, you can see at the place of the edit, you can see two colored peaks. And what that two color peak represents in this case is where we've inserted a CTT. So you can see that C is that blue peak here, the T is the red, the T is the red. The reason why you see two peaks here is it has to do with editing efficiency. We're not editing every cell in the population of cells. So at that position or the position of the edit, we have some cells that are a particular base, the unedited cells and other cells on another base. And that's why you know, for businesses out there, this is an example of super positioning that you see in the waveforms that we're pulling out here. And here, this is a less uh, complicated example where we're not inserting and we're not causing, you know, a shift in the lettering, but we're just changing one letter. And you can see, if you look really hard, there's this little green bump. And that represents cells that have been edited from a C to an A. Um, and you can see not many cells, given how big that bump is, have been edited and hence optimizing for editing efficiency. So onto something that people are more excited about is validation of editing of the Gene site in HEC293. The reason why I'm saying site is because that's a mutation found in patients. So in normal, in normal um, genomes, they don't have a mutation there. So what we do, what we're actually doing at the site is actually we're putting in the mutation instead of correcting out the mutation. But it's the thought that the reciprocal, if we can put in the mutation, then the process of 
taking out the mutation or correcting that mutation will be very similar and the design is almost the same but a switch in the template itself so what i'm showing here if just if you just focus here that little blue bar represents 11 percent of the cells being edited so this is proof of concept that we can target a gene mutation and put in the mutation and the thought is we can take these cells that we put in the gene he mutation and we can actually use those cells to actually correct them back to what we got. And we can apply this editing technology. Um, this is a table we put in the grant proposal for, um, for other mutations that we actually, um, that we also have patient cells, um, other founder mutations. But what we still were working on before COVID happened and this was, um, and you would notice the name down here. So this is a talent grad student in my lab that's working on is optimizing this further. She wants to get better than 11%. And, um, and this was just the first time round. So these things require optimization. So what's in progress and what Catherine is very excited to work on is actually validating this in gene patient cells. That is patient cells with the Middle East mutation. And this is just a picture of how the cells look like that we took from some patients from their skin biopsy. And you can see that these are skin cells and this is how they look like at different magnifications. And this is some of the collection that we took with the help of uh, Dr. Mosafar and his team uh, who were wonderful that day in terms of the collection. So that wraps up what we're doing in terms of CRISPR editing on patient cells. And I just want to wrap up and thank you Thank the NDF for their support and allowing us to work on this alternate technology and also the patients themselves. Without the patient samples, we wouldn't be able to validate this approach. Great. Thank you, Moncal, for the exciting update on the work that's going on in the lab. Um, it's Angela again. And Lali, let me know if I'm uh, going over time or if there are time uh, restrictions. So. Um, Next, what I wanted to discuss with you is that although CRISPR technology, as Monkol has explained, does hold a lot of promise, we need to pre uh, proceed cautiously. It's a very new technology and there are potentially several safety considerations. So firstly, the main way that uh, scientists use to deliver CRISPR, or actually just gene therapy in general, is using viral vectors. You may have heard of the term AAV. Um, uh, and we need to make sure that um, these uh, viruses get to where they need to be and that um, the body um, doesn't essentially attack it. So if your body has seen this virus before, this technology will likely not work very well for you given that um, you'll have what's known as pre-existing neutralizing antibodies, which will neutralize the AAV before it can get to where it needs to be and deliver its payload. So um, it's, it's known that about 50% of, of the adult population will have um, pre-existing antibodies to, to different forms of AAV. So we, that's something that we need to keep in mind. We also need to consider that the body may not like the Cas9 protein, which is um, what I told you previously, is a bacterial protein. So by introducing the Cas9 protein, which is part of the CRISPR um, complex, the body might see that as you know, um, a bacteria trying to attack the body and then try to mount an immune response against that. And then lastly, um, uh, safety. another safety consideration, as Monkol touched upon, is um, to make sure that the, uh, the Cas9 um, and the CRISPR complex does indeed go to where we intend it to go um, and not to a different address, um, which sometimes does happen. Um, we don't want it to, to, to go to a different address and then perform, perform uh, editing on, on a gene that, that uh, is not related to gene myopathy. So, to summarize, um, here are the current challenges of uh, gene therapy, um, which both includes gene replacement as well as uh, gene editing technologies. So scientists um, need to make sure that delivering um, we, we're delivering enough of the components, whether it's the gene or the editing uh, machinery, 
inside the right cell. So delivery is a really difficult problem, um, a difficult logistic challenge, and it needs to get to where it needs to go, which is the, all the muscle cells in the body and say, avoid um, uh, other parts of the body, like for example, the liver cells, in, in which we don't really need to correct um, gene mutation. Once it gets delivered to the right place, and um, it enters the cells, we need to figure out how to sufficiently turn on the gene or to induce high levels of correction. So that's the next challenge. And as I touched upon in the previous slide, how do we avoid, um, how do we avoid uh, the body from mounting a strong immune response that will make the individual very sick um, once we introduce some of these foreign components? And lastly, there are extremely high costs associated with both these technologies and limited production capacity. So, I mean, for each individual to be treated, it's in the order of millions. Who's going to cover this cost? And uh, moreover, there is uh, currently a very long um, queue, very long um, line to get this AAV stuff um, because it's a very specialized technology to be, to be um, produced. So here are the takeaway messages for today. Um, gene editing, um, mainly using CRISPR technology, is another form of gene therapy, and it has the potential to change DNA to correct um, gene uh, myopathy mutations. Researchers have demonstrated the correction of um, several other genetic diseases with this CRISPR technology. And so gene editing provides another alternative to gene replacement therapy for gene myopathy. CRISPR technology is, as Malcolm has mentioned, is feasible in targeting common mutations um, uh, uh, typically found in gene myopathy patients. What's next is um, testing the feasibility of editing mutations in gene, particularly using um, the patient cells, designing um, the therapy, um, which includes what vector we'll put it in, what promoter to use, and, and the exact component of, of the CRISPR machinery, and then testing it in a suitable gene animal model to see if we can rescue some sort of, um, of symptom. Um, and then preparing for clinical trials is a really key one. What are the relevant outcome measures um, that, that, that will tell us if this therapy is working? And finally, raising funds for the mass production of the therapy, um, uh, all of which uh, currently um, the NDF is, is, is um, uh, focusing on and, and dedicating funds towards. So the last one is very important. Um, you know, uh, I think that the only body that has enough um, sort of, that has the capacity to deliver um, uh, genetic therapies to the masses are biotech companies or pharmaceutical companies, which is why the NDF is strongly focused on developing a partnership with, with them. So thank you everyone. Um, I'd like to thank the LEC Lab, NDF team, the donors, patients and the research community for all the support and for including us in your family. And thank you so much for that elegant um, presentation. It really was very informative and I, uh, I appreciate you guys adding that final takeaway uh, screen, which we've also replicated just for people, just to wrap up what, what it is that we learned. And I think what's uh, really interesting, and I can tell by the questions coming in, um, is that really we understand that CRISPR technology is another form of gene therapy. It's an alternative to, um, to gene replacement therapy. Um, I, I see a question from Mangesh saying, is the takeaway that gene editing is actually uh, more suitable to g and &E myopathy than gene replacement therapy. And I didn't hear you say that. I just heard you say. No, I wouldn't say it's more suitable. It's just different. And right. it, yeah. And so um, are you having any luck sharing your... Um, no, 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 we're no. trying everything. Oh, well, we're, hitting, 
yeah we'll put it on here um i just wanted to also uh turn it over first of all so many people from so many different countries and places welcome everyone um so many familiar places and people uh mangesh's question so is not that it, you're saying it's it's a better alternative but really what the takeaway is that really what we've learned through funding your study is that it is actually um you know, the, first of all, we learned about the distinction between the two. And then what we learned is that um, the problem that you solved is that your preliminary results show that GNE gene can, in fact, be edited. Um, so that's targeted good. and edited, yeah. correct. And yeah. That is not the case for all genes. No. Um, and, it, and, it, and, that, uh, and Lauren, that goes for. Um, um, that's not the case for all mutations in a particular gene too. So it's it's not necessarily gene, it's um, the location of the mutation. Um, not all of them are easily targeted. So the goal is um, for some of the other um, mutations that we have patient cells is to see, you know, which ones can we target, which ones can't we target. Right, right, excellent. Uh, what people are asking if, about is the timeline. They're asking if this, for example, is something that would be viable within the next five years. Um, you know, this is a delicate question to answer because um, I know that scientists hate the three questions I always love to ask, which is what problem are you trying to solve? Uh, how much is it going to cost and how long is it going to take? And how long is it going to take is always the most difficult bit to answer. But given the 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 way that technology is sort of expediting things and the rate of acceleration is increasing do you see this happening in the next couple of years oh wow that's a tough one because it largely also depends on the progress in the wider scientific community um mm. and and the fda's sort of opinion on crispr technology mm. in for use in the body um and we're really um, hoping that some of the other diseases such as the Shen muscular dystrophy will pave the way. Yeah. Um, they're a few steps ahead. And if you know they were to get FDA approval for use in humans, that will really expedite its use for other muscle wasting diseases yeah. such as g and &E myopathy. So I think with a lot of the other diseases, they've really laid down some of the difficult groundwork that um, we can then um, potentially leverage off in order to get a, a, a CRISPR-based therapy into the into the patient community. Um, I think I, if I were to speak to the Duchenne um, community, um, particularly those working on CRISPR, I would say yes, it would be used it, it, likely in humans within the next five years. I think it's it, they're very close. I'd say less than two. Um, and uh, whereas with Jeannie, I'm, I think so. I, what do you think, Monko? I, I, I'm really cautious and I'm very... <laughs> well, I'm not going to give me yeah. to a year, Matt Lally, to that. But what yeah. I can say is that I, I've i never seen um, technology. So um, I had the good fortune of being in the Broad Institute when the CRISPR technology like exploded in 2014 and I have never seen technology explode this fast before and the, the great thing about this technology if I didn't get it across is that it is easily applicable to all um, genetic diseases and it's programmable so what works for disease x will work for disease y so people make breakthroughs in, in delivering it better making it more efficiency more efficient that diseases like gene myopathy can actually piggyback the only thing that will be different is the address we go to so in this case for example where the middle eastern mutation is say where the japanese mutation is that is the only difference and you you think about it there has never been a technology that's so flexible and programmable so it's the hope that the technology that's being built is sort of like a platform that will work for all genetic diseases. And that, and that means that um, all the stakeholders, not just muscle disease stakeholders, but all stakeholders in genetic diseases will hopefully combine their efforts to accelerate um, the development of this um, technology, the development of the efficiency and efficacy of this technology, and lastly, most importantly, the development of the safety of this technology.
Right. Um, and I guess this is one example in which I think to, to Angela's point, it's a good thing not to be first to market, uh, you know, learning from the pitfalls of other people that have gone before yeah. us is, uh, you know, obviously extraordinarily, it's, 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 it's a problem for them, but it's something that we can keep. And then I think something that's not discussed very often about gene therapy is the antibody problem, which prevents you from really doing this more than once. Um, you know, so it's really important um, from my lay understanding of this to make sure that we get it right before uh, you go ahead with some sort of modification of the gene, because from my understanding, you know, this really can, it cannot happen twice in a lifetime at least mm -hmm. right now, correct? Correct. Right. Yes. correct. Yeah. So, so when people say, hurry up, why isn't this happening sooner? Um, I think the, the real answer is that, you know, would you trade in some other organ uh, to fix another problem before fully understanding this? And and sometimes, and I think, and this is a very delicate topic, but the the as 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 advocates for uh, GNE myopathy and their patients, one of the things we are unfortunately charged with is having to prevent ambition and um, hopefulness and wishful thinking. We have to sometimes advocate in ways that mean uh, the, the, in, in ways that the patients don't always appreciate um, because they think that we're you know stalling or delaying uh, unnecessarily but that's actually a safety thing so I think it's uh, it's something that needs to be repeated early and often. Yeah. Um, um, but Lali can I just add to that in terms please. of the you know um, one thing we do want to get across is you know it, um, that some of the technologies we're trying it it isn't a case of stalling. Uh, some of the technology was only available three months ago. So, you know, we want to be on the cutting edge, but being on the cutting edge means that, um, you know, um, that some things will take time, but it's just for the audience to know that the technology that we achieved the editing was only available at the end of 2019. It wasn't available yeah. for the last six years. Uh, right, just, right. I just want to circle back and um, talk about, so Moko presented that our collaborators have designed a CRISPR um, therapy to correct his cells, right? To achieve, what is it, 70, 80% correction in of his cells in a dish. I, I, we're, we're in the same position as you guys. Would Moko has a muscle, genetic muscle wasting disease, not gene myopathy, but limb girdle. Would he go out tomorrow, knock on the collaborator's door and go, can I have that therapy? The answer is no. <laughs> no, because it needs to go through rigorous testing in animals for safety, for efficacy, to make sure, like, I, I need to be so sure that it's not going to do something bad to Moncol that's even worse than his muscular dystrophy, which it can. Because we're really, this is such an artificial thing that we're doing. We're getting a virus, we're getting bacterial proteins, we're injecting it in him. What if his body doesn't like it? What if his body breaks out into cancer? What if the immune response is so strong he dies and it collapses his liver? You know, like it's so, it's, we need to proceed very cautiously. Um, we're really essentially playing God with, with, um, with molecular biology here and, and we, we don't we don't know but we're, we're not god and so mother nature might have a way of, of punishing us for trying to be too ambitious <laughs> well I, th I think that's a very important point and uh, not to put too fine a point on it but i think there is a really legitimate answer to people including investigators who want to push forward um uh and and may not be considering the whole uh issue and and that's why at ndf we really do we defer to the consensus and not one the the direction of just one investigator but really the consortium and the consensus that we get from everyone um so another question is um so uh, uh ashikil is asking if so gene therapy can reverse the symptoms question mark i think uh you know so this is this yeah. is a pretty it's 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 a standard question i i would my gut feel no one no one knows for sure but um my gut feeling and i'm pretty sure mom calls too is that no it will not because the muscles um that have wasted away you know it's not gonna come back on its own and then that requires some sort of cell-based therapy to to kind of reverse those symptoms I think that um, 
the current hope is to halt the condition from getting worse, but really we're venturing into unknown territory. So um, our best guess, but you know, again, it's just a guess is that no, it won't, won't reverse the symptoms. But it will, but it will prevent what? Yeah. It will, so if it doesn't go back, it'll just prevent it from further escalation, further- From further, from further, from further yeah. escalation and further muscle weakness and wasting. Right. Because then, now you've given, you've either given the right protein that can do its function that it previously couldn't, or you've corrected the gene and now, now your muscles can function properly. Right. But I mean, in, in, in terms of, of, of providing hope for, for patients in general, I think it's really important to know, and as you guys know, my background is in Silicon Valley and, 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 and technology. Um, and I love this intersection between biology and technology, which, you know, brings us all to such exciting place. Um, this really is very hopeful in the sense that like, like you guys said, this didn't exist several years ago and this is an option and maybe there'll be some um, secondary and even tertiary therapies. I that agree, can I, agree. Yes. I agree, Lali. Yep. Yeah, I think sometime in the near future, there will be a way to reverse the symptoms, but right. for right now, this technology, <laughs> that's not, I don't think that that's the aim. It's in the early stages. So I think that's yeah. very hopeful. I mean, that that we're, we're arriving at a place where people are working simultaneously on different things. So gene therapy is not a one-stop shop, particularly yeah. at no. this moment, but maybe no. with supplemental therapies, there will be yeah. sometimes something yeah. that Correct. Yeah. So right now, the consensus amongst um, the muscle, um, the genetic muscle uh, community is that you know there is not going to be a silver bullet, okay, for uh, in terms of therapies. It's going to be a combinatorial approach. It's going to be gene therapy. It's going to be cell therapy. It's going to be like um, supplements. Like it's it's going to be. Uh, at the end of the day, it's going to be a few things that the patients will take. That that that's what we're aiming for. Right. It's just one of a few therapies that patients are going to be used to manage their condition, not cure it, but manage. Correct, correct. And baby steps. So there's an interesting question that's being posed, and 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 uh, it's my ear. Uh, why can't we just add a manufactured G and E gene into our body without correcting or editing the malfunctioning gene? You can, yeah, and yeah, that's that's, that's gene replacement therapy. That's that's um that's been tried for um as I mentioned um in the uh, in my presentation for SMA and Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and that's worked well. So that is that is a form of gene therapy. It's known as gene replacement therapy. I see. Correct. And, and and so that is what we're doing. And as you guys know, that NDF is is putting is yep. not leaving any doors closed. We're 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 investigating mm -hmm. and looking yep. at. Um, yeah, and correct. And I find Paul Martin is doing that. Stella has tried it in yeah. the past too. So quite a few people um, yeah. are working on that. And when she says Stella, she's referring obviously to Dr. Stella Rosenbaum um, out of Hadassah. Um, Tammy Hardman has a question. Why can some mutations be edited and others not based on their location? You, you, you referred to in your presentation. Yeah, so, um, so basically I tell a fib when I said that um, Cas9 can be programmed to go anywhere in the genome. It can go anywhere in the genome provided, provided that an address has a particular letter in it. So, so depending on the 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 Cas9, because Cas9 is from bacteria. So, depending on from what bacterial species it's from, it can go to a, a particular thing. So, it's, the Cas9 the, likes the, certain letters, but not other yeah, letters. So, the analogy would be Cas9 could go to every address that ends with a two on any street in America. And so, so you know, there are restrictions, but sometimes you can get around some of that restrictions. And prime editing through the way you can design it is that restriction when the Cas9 is still there, but you can get around it by uh, the other two pieces, the, uh, the primer binding site and the reverse transcript days template, you can make larger or smaller to to get around that. So it may not go to the place exactly where you want, but you can get around that. But with CRISPR base editing, you can't get around that. So there are slight restrictions on it. And it's the hope that in the future, that those restrictions will be removed. And, the, and that's why I showed in one of the slides, which one of the common mutations in GNE that we can actually target. And even though we can target we may be able to edit some at higher efficiency than others too. And that's why we have to test it out 
in the lab and not just say in theory we can target it. I see. Thank you for that. And then she goes on to ask another question. What what disease would you um, would give you antibodies to the viral vector? And if you do have antibodies to the viral vector, then I guess you are out of luck for gene therapy for G and E myopathy. What disease? Sometimes it's just by the um, the course of everyday life you encounter these um well 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 the antibodies of these viral vectors um a, a lot of them um so it's the adeno associated virus that we're um that most gene therapies are using and they're actually naturally occurring yeah. that's in a way what makes them safe that a lot of humans have been exposed to it in their lifetime in the and, wild <laughs> um yeah and so it is something you find it's not something that you know was artificially made in the lab it was artificially <laughs> modified in the lab to be used but it is found you know in the wild in nature like say the epstein bar virus that causes um a common i think it's mono that causes mono uh -huh. um yeah, so okay. and that's how people can get antibodies to it but to the second question i know this is a long-standing question where you have existing you know um uh, immune response to it you know what could happen i think it's a very active area of research and you know and it's the hope to stay positive uh, on that active area of research that so there are ways and one way is um that people are working on is second and third generation viral vectors to deliver it and it's the hope that those viral vectors because that they're they're artificially made that the body will won't recognize that as a virus that's typically found in nature so um there's also technology other delivery vehicles that um don't rely on viruses so they rely on biopolymers or you know nanoparticles which the body will not um have pre-neutralizing antibodies to um that people are uh, using to deliver crispers and other gene therapies so there are definitely alternate strategies that are being worked on, um, but currently, in its current form, the most popular form is to deliver it via um, uh, the adeno-associated AAV virus. I see, and so, and, and, and a lot of questions are coming in um, about, you know, can you reiterate the whole one-time, is it a one-time treatment? Um, and, and the reasons for why it needs to be a one-time treatment, because I think it's causing a little confusion. Uh, for instance, one of the questions are, since there are more than 150 different GNEM mutations, would the same gene therapy procedure work for all of the mutations? And will it be a one-time treatment? And how long will it take to notice improvement? I realize these are very specific, but I think these are the kinds of things we need to address. Okay. Um, yeah. So it's a one-time treatment with if you're using the AAV virus delivery for either gene replacement or gene editing, because um, as we mentioned, your body will start to develop antibodies against the virus particles and neutralize them before it can get to the cells um, upon repeated deliveries. Does that make sense? Lali, that makes sense to you, right? Yes, to me, yes, yes. Uh, the, uh, yeah, well, uh, I'm the, getting there. The, the, the other question I think, um, well, the other part of that question is about the different mutations. And I think that's one of the advantages of gene replacement therapy that you're replacing, um, you know, the two bad copies with a working copy and it, it's sort of like agnostic or it doesn't depend what the mutation is. While with a, a CRISPR editing approach, it's very, very mutation dependent and that's why it's better or more feasible to take an approach of just addressing the common mutations. Yeah. So, right. And then the how long it's going to, to take an effect, uh, your guess is it's going to fine. Nobody will, nobody knows. It depends how to... much we can get in there. Right. Um, and, you know, if it gets in there and does its thing, yeah. Because this is happening in other countries, we just want to know, you know, if there's, you know, because that, that's a question that people are asking, like, is it just the US or is this happening in other countries? We know there's a lot of activity happening in China. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I know I know that um, lots of other countries with more laxed sort of barriers and safety um, standards are, are, are trialing. I know, you know, a lot of countries are trialing this um, just to 
it's it's very scary because you need to proceed really cautiously and we don't we don't want to give the technology a bad name um so I, I, you may know that gene therapy the whole field was halted for about 10 years and no progress could be made because um somebody died during one of the clinical trials because um hey this is the story of jesse gelsinger which you may know so we don't want something like that to to happen and stall the whole field and give crispr or gene therapy a bad name because yes. then the FDA will 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 say, okay, it's killed someone. No, it's not safe. Um, but you know that's why we're really we're really hoping that you know all these other countries will um, play by the books and follow the correct um, safety guidelines and 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 rigorous testing before putting it into humans. But we know that's not the case. It's already well, gone. You know, but I think the more education we have on this topic, and I hope that this kind of series, speaker series, is is helpful in that at least our patients and our stakeholders can understand what the issues are related to why it's um what it's it's not the FDA being difficult, but really we want to make sure that when we do do this once in a lifetime treatment, that is going to be efficacious and safe and replicable and scalable so that we can learn from it and continue to do good with it as opposed to uh, giving way to some of our very tempting ambitions to get it done or to for, for scientific curiosity or maybe to be the first guy to get famous for doing it and, and really take not enough precaution and get it done faster. So I really, really need to belabor that for the numerous people that ask me this on the daily basis. Um, I think um, I have time for one final question, um, if you don't mind, and that's uh, from Joya, and she wants to know, uh, do you need more samples in order to uh, get this continue to, the, to do this study and I know that you've already agreed to do uh, another talk um, on the topic of what you're doing with the samples that you've already collected um, from our patient population from uh, my you know from our Philadelphia from our UCLA event as well as from our patients in Israel and India when we visited so could you address that a little bit please yeah I can jump on um, so um... I, I think um, what, what we're in the process of doing is uh, validating all the mutations in the patient cell line. So, you know, just to make sure, you know, everything uh, is um, sort of like consistent and um, correct. Um, and then after that, we'll probably uh, identify some of the things that um, we um, that we don't have, we don't have full coverage. And that way, uh, you know, although, you know, the collection at those patient conferences have been highly successful. They haven't been targeted. And, and the hope that even though it's not targeted, we would cover a lot of the common mutations. So then um, the hope is to work with the NDF to do a targeted recruitment of particular mutations so that, so that the things we try in the lab and others in the NDF research community can try it on a range of different mutations because we know that there is a relationship between mutation and some of the phenotypes we see both in the patients and also in their cells. So to answer that, um, we'll go through the samples and we'll see if we have any sort of like blind spots or missing things and work with the end to collect that. And, Wonderful. You know, and, uh, and but I don't want that. patients to go through unnecessary suffering if we have already enough of that mutational type. Mm -hmm. But obviously we're very grateful to patients who are willing to share their samples for the benefit of science. And for those of you who've already provided samples and are curious what's happening, um, I do want to assure you that both Monkol and Angela have agreed to give another talk on that subject about what we're doing with that. And we'll be scheduling that moving forward. Um, next week, we'll be hearing from Dr. Kelly Crow at Mount St. Joseph University. Uh, she'll be talking about her study and her work uh, with lectin staining and identifying biomarkers, which I think is going to be, you'll start to see why all of this work that Monkel and Angela are doing and how it dovetails with the other folks and how eventually you'll see an entire photo that's more clear than the mosaic it is for you right now, how each one of these studies is absolutely necessary and um, why it gives us more information that will eventually get us to a place uh, that will provide sufficient proof of concept to the uh, FDA and we will be able to move forward with um, human trials for gene therapy. But that's our goal. That's what we're working on. 
Um, it's always more complicated than um, people appreciate. And I really, really, unless there's any further questions um, uh, from uh, from folks across the world. Uh, I, hi, Suleiman, your uh, Dr. Suleiman is a patient and also a doctor, medical doctor in Turkey. And uh, I understand that we need to um, continue with this so that you can continue to send us emails and questions. If you have, please send it to info at curehibm.org and we will be able to answer your questions once we check back with Monkel and Angela. Um, we really, again, thank everyone for participating in this meeting. We will be editing this just so that, uh, you know, to shorten it a little bit and provide it for you guys online in our library. Uh, again, you guys were part of history today. This is the first of our online speaker series. Monkel and Angela, we're very, very grateful uh, to you for your time, but also for your just being such great members of our team. Uh, really, really appreciate all of you. Thank you, everyone, and we'll see you online. Take care. <laughs>